Eleanor Powells is the director of the Anticipatory Intelligence Lab with the Wilson Center's Science and Technology Innovation Program. And Richard Solash is editor of the Wilson Center's award-winning journal, The Wilson Quarterly. And The Quarterly has been in publication since 1976, and it's now an all-digital magazine. I want to welcome both of you to talk to us about the newest issue. The, the issue living with artificial intelligence, and we're going to do it with real intelligence today. <laughs> Here's what the subtitle says on the, on the website. Humans created AI. Now humanity must learn how to live with it. And then it goes on and ends up by saying it's the start of the algorithmic age. Intriguing. Tell us what this is all about, Richard. Yes, that, uh, that's a little line or two that I penned uh, as editor of the quarterly. Uh, and it was based on my sense. Um, that this topic um, is not something that we should describe as disruptive, which is a very much overused term, I think, um, but as something that will dwarf that characterization uh, in both scope and depth. Um, AI, they call it uh, as they call it part of the fourth industrial revolution. Um, obviously, speaking from a, a non-expert perspective, uh, Eleanor is certainly the right person to give you an expert take. But in reading the piece myself, I got quite an education and a revelation. Um, this AI and advances in technology related to AI seems to me will upend industry after industry. Um, but I think something else you pointed out, John, um, is that this issue of the quarterly uh, doesn't just look at AI, but also reveals uh, the human implications, mm -hmm. uh, which I think sometimes tends to get lost, especially uh, in talking about technological developments. Um, and, and in talking about the human implications, I feel that we're not only talking about um, something philosophical or spiritual, but also something with very distinct policy implications uh, that have to be considered. And then by extension, domestic policy implications, social policy within one country get expanded to geopolitics and foreign policy implications. So we tried to touch on all of that uh, in that little blurb to describe the issue and, and develop those threads in the articles within. Well, I, I think it's effective in doing that. And I, and I like your explanation of rejecting the term disruptive, which could speak to temporary circumstances, right? Us, a big storm can be disruptive. Right. We're talking about something that's going to change the way we live. Right. Everything about us. So the, the your article uh, is searching for privacy in the Internet of Bodies. <clears throat> great at coming up with new terminology. <laughs> Compelling title, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. yes, is Tell us what is this about. So the Internet of Bodies. Um, imagine the power of AI. What is artificial intelligence? It's a way to automate computation and cognition. So we can now automate learning, perceiving, uh, doing computation. It's a pervasive general purpose technology that will be used in all of our industries that will come into our professional networks, our private networks, our schools, our industries and our offices. What I wanted to epitomize with the Internet of Bodies is this notion that we will be under assessment, we will be under measure of computation in every aspect of our lives in the future, from what you eat, who you date, what you buy on the internet, um, how much energy you use, but also what are your vital signs, how well are you doing in terms of health, uh, what kind of specific genetic quirks do you have, what's your genome telling about your health, about your mental health, mm -hmm. about how well you are doing, how well you are aging, what kind of disease you are sus susceptible to. So how does that work? Um, you have to start with this notion of the Internet of Things, the fact that most of our devices, from our watch, from our phone, from our coffee maker, are actually plugged into a wider network where AI, as a form of computation, can analyze all of those data, optimize those data, and get you some, some answers. Um, now, imagine that you add to those networks devices that are health devices, that are extremely private, Implants inside and out outside our bodies, pacemakers, um, Fitbit watch, um, what else? You could imagine in the future DNA portable sequencers that we could use to sequence the genomes of microbes in the metro, mm -hmm. in the New York metro, uh, in the airport, that we could use to analyze the content of our, um, of our, our, you know, of our perspiration, of all of the different bodily fluids we have. That means that in the future, potentially states, nation states, 
potentially rising tech platforms, very powerful tech platforms, will have access to our most intimate data, what define us and what shape our lives, our future, our aging process. Just remembering in the Internet of Things, we're <laughs> things too. We are things, we're living, we're living things. The, 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 you have a really interesting introduction uh, to the piece where you look into the future, uh -huh. you know, sort of a speculative. You described a lot of the possibilities there. It has a bit of an Orwellian twinge to it. Well. <laughs> uh, 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 talk about that. And, is, and are the trend lines heading there, or is this just a cautionary tale? No, they could be. So I'm a bit of a futurist. Um, I think foresight and storytelling are the most powerful tools for people to understand um, what we are facing and how to reclaim our futures. And we will have a challenge in the coming decades that will be how do we reclaim our futures? How do we make sure that AI, which is a human-made technology, can be shaped to our values? And I, I call on everybody to start being interested in this idea because we will have to, to do due diligence here. Um, so this scenario was about a world where we don't have privacy anymore as we, as we knew it. Um, so privacy is a notion that my grandmother you know, has a kind of a perspective on. All of that would be, would be canceled. The idea is that human beings could be followed by their own uh, drones, their personal drones, that are streaming personal data, intimate biological data about each individual, and following them as a, as a digital avatar, as a guardian, as a guardian drone. Uh, you can do already a lot with drones. So drones are... It's, it's a robot, right? That's if, where... If they can mow the lawn, I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> That's where robotic <laughs> merges with AI, right? Yeah. So uh, a drone is a robot. It's, uh, the, the navigation system is powered by AI. Now, with a drone, you can drop uh, vaccines, you can drop blood in Rwanda in a remote uh, location where nobody has access to either vaccines or blood for, for transfusion. You can provide refugees camp with uh, food, with you know, water, different things they need. Um, you can do you can do so much good. It mm -hmm. could be a new AI could be in that sense a new technological diplomacy. At the same time, if we get it right, yes, you could also spread, you know, toxins. Mm -hmm. You could spread chemical weapons. Disrupt the grid of smart agents. cities. Yeah, you could uh, you could disrupt, surveil, monitor, monitor all of our. All of our lives. Yeah. All the of the our storytelling aspect, I want to ask you about that in, sure. the, in the broader context of your sure. approach to the sure. WQ. Uh, uh, you, you're not just uh, looking for uh, dry policy briefs, and I say that from a place that specializes <laughs> in dry policy briefs. Get them right here. Uh, talk about that a bit, that approach. Sure. Um, maybe I could take a slight detour first and pick up on, on one thing sure. Eleanor said, which I think is extremely interesting. The idea of reclaiming the future, uh -huh. that's, that's a tricky little bit yeah, of mental little time acrobatics travel right there. <laughs> there. Um, but I think that that metaphor in its kind of far out way speaks to not the disruptive but the transformative nature of what we're talking about. That the future is not something that we should assume is going to be the way it is today in very fundamental ways. And that's why I, 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 I took this alliteration uh, to, call, to call this issue a look into the algorithmic age, that there will be transformations here. Mm -hmm. That seg segues into your question, uh, John, about how I try to present this. Uh, you're absolutely right. Um, the Wilson Quarterly is definitely not a vehicle for policy briefs, dry or otherwise. Uh, as a matter of fact, it's supposed to be the opposite of dry. This is supposed to be a way to engage a broad audience, not an expert audience. Um, I'm certainly among the non-experts. Um, in the audience for, for most of the topics that we write about in the quarterly, to engage, to be compelling, to be provocative, to get at real policy questions and real human questions, but through a medium that is accessible and relatable and not terribly wonky. Um, it's, it's an opportunity for high quality, long form journalism and essays. Um, and therefore, is a, is a rare is a rare species in in the Washington D.C. think tank world, and I think really one of the interesting yeah, things that, a, that the center brings to bear makes it a terrific product. Mm. And I, I know when Richard was saying wonky, he wasn't referring to you. Not <laughs> not in the slightest. <laughs> not in the slightest. That's our story. We're sticking to it. The the, mm. the question of promise versus peril. Uh -huh. It seems to me an unfair fight, in that innovation will always be ahead of regulation. Uh -huh. Is that the case? It is the case. Um, I would say that AI is the most um, dual-use technology I've ever encountered. 
uh, and I've been working on converging technologies for the last 10 years. Um, I would even say it's a dual nature technology in the sense that uh, the engineers were, as we speak, designing algorithms, trying to think about what the values and what the goals um, inside those algorithms, what those values are going to be optimizing for. Um, that, that all process is going to be driving um, how well or how badly this technology can be used. So there is a lot of power upstream in the design process, in the engineering process. People who do this are a, a very fairly small community. Um, so in a way, you could think our future is in the hands of, of a few engineers or a few groups of engineers. Wow. Not if we actually try to reclaim our futures by thinking wisdom, working wisdom um, about how to, how, you know, how to think, what are we trying to optimize for? What is the long path? Do we want to have better advertisement, better, better dating websites? Or do we actually, are we actually trying to optimize um, how our city functions, um, how uh, you know, uh, help and humanitarian uh, goods can be, can be shared with different populations? Are we trying to think about how AI will disrupt um, or transform industries in uh, in India, uh, different markets in countries that I'm are. I'm tempted to say all of the above, depending on that who are you're manufacturing. To. You see, so um, so it's really a, a dual nature technology. Also, because you know, I explained in my piece how it gets at our most uh, intimate data. The policy discussion is f definitely lagging behind. Although there are a few, um, I would say more than a few, um, a lot of people interested in getting into that discussion. The problem I see is that we, we don't even have, right now, the modalities of how to conduct this discussion. Mm -hmm. It has to be global. It has to be global. Why? Because the engineers, the tech platforms that are designing our futures as we speak are supranational. They go over borders. So one country cannot necessarily have an impact on the development of this technology. We have to, we need to figure out what the modalities of this global governance discussion ought to be. And who to invite to the meeting. And whose voice are going to be heard. And that's a very key question because we've not been, we've not been that good in the past at either anticipating the future or being inclusive and being sure that everyone in society is represented in that conversation. And there you get into another issue, which is digital literacy. How do we give, how do we empower the next generation and the older ones to understand what's happening well enough so that they can prote protect themselves, they can be an actor in this innovation journey? Yeah. We also tend to adopt the technology first and then question whether it was a good idea uh -huh. second. Yeah, that's these, these are all big questions. They're scary questions. Um, for most people, myself included, the, the, even the term artificial intelligence is, is a bit of a conundrum. So what better place to ask these questions than we figure than in a publication like The Quarterly, which aims to ask them to a broad range uh, of people uh, to get people thinking about these questions, which need to be addressed right now. Well, well, I want to ask both of you this notion too. Well, one as an expert, another as someone who's done a deep dive. W when lay people like me talk about artificial intelligence, we're often thinking about when machines are as smart or smarter than us, or as capable uh, as our brains. Uh, you know, the singularity, right? Uh -huh. uh, is that what we're talking about now? And if we're not, what is the gap between where AI sits today? and that moment. Uh -huh. So right now what's happening is that those self-teaching computers are able to uh, mainly optimize data. And that's why we need so much data liquidity into the system, S you know, a massive amounts of data to be able for those self-teaching computers to keep learning and to be able to recognize your face in a crowd, recognize specific biomarkers in our genomes. That's where we, we are at now. But Eleanor, let me ask you about when you say self-teaching, Mm -hmm. I, I can teach myself to knit or play golf or whatever it might be. Uh, machines can't do that without somebody programming them, with algorithms provided or things like that. Is that correct? I mean, so what is the difference between artificial intelligence and real intelligence? It actually goes beyond uh, just writing a program. That's probably one of the first uh, phase of development of AI. You write a program, you uh, classify you know, the different decisions that are going to be taken. Um, in this case, we're talking about algorithms that, because they are faced with massive amounts of data, can start to learn and differentiate on, on their own. Um, if, you, you know, if you take the, um, 
the issues of uh, playing chess or those different games that have been uh, surpassed by different computers, those computers were able to actually simulate simulate up to 20 different strategies in a few seconds. Our, our human brain doesn't work that way. Mm -hmm. But we, we are, we, you know, we have um, a life experience that help us learn in, in a, I would say in a more efficient way. Uh, you learn, you know, to, to, to ride a bike, you know, that you have to move your, your balance. You, you learn uh, based on uh, cognitive equipment that takes into account the environment. And so we, we are clever by the way we actually understand so many things at once. Well, we also introduce things like morals or values into the equation. Yeah. Do machines do that? Does artificial intelligence do that? Or can it someday do that? Well, you know, when you optimize a process, you optimize uh, for a certain goal, you could say for a certain value. So that's where we're already facing to some extent, issues that, that could be of interest. Are you actually, are you optimizing, um, you know, using data that are not necessarily inclusive? What happens when you do that? So there are already questions. And who chooses the value? Right now, well, the machines can the machines do it themselves eventually. Is that the idea? Um, that's that's in process and in development. But right now, that thinking is left to the engineers. So, uh, having done this deep dive, has it w talk about how your notion of what AI is uh, or can be has evolved. It's scary. Um, it's striking, uh, and it's coming, and it's here. Um, and the title of the issue is "Living with Artificial Intelligence." Uh, and that was chosen judiciously um, and with thought um, because it is reshaping reality um, and it will continue to. Uh, and a lot of the questions that Eleanor brought up um, and that I had uh, when I first approached the topic of AI for an issue of the Wilson Quarterly are elucidated, developed, even perhaps answered, these are tough questions to answer definitively, definitively of course, within the issues of the, within the articles of the issue. Um, you asked about morals. Uh, one thing that I am pleased with in this issue was that in Eleanor's article and in others, ethics um, and moral questions um, are definitely brought to the fore. Mm -hmm. um, it seems to me uh, that this is extremely important for policymakers, for the public, and as Eleanor mentioned, a very broad range of interlocutors to consider. Everyone in particular, <laughs> actually, not in particular, everyone. Um, one thing I should mention, we tried to get at that very same question, and a lot of the conundrums um, and difficulties involved in this topic and its implications in an interactive slideshow we put together. Uh, which is about how artists are actually appropriating AI. Uh, I thought that this would actually be not just a little bit of color to add to the issue, um, but a very interesting and needed perspective. Um, humans have always relied on the arts to help us make sense of the world around sure. us and to ask questions um, that are very important. And so we actually feature the work of several artists who are asking these questions through their art. Uh, and raising and raising yet more questions, not only about the technology, but about who we are and the interface between the two. Uh, Eleanor, I, I know I've asked you this before, but I think for the benefit of people watching this discussion, the difference between artificial intelligence and anticipatory intelligence in your lab title. Uh -huh. um, anticipatory intelligence is uh, actually a field of intelligence. So it's a field of uh, policy making um, that's trying to to, r to run very deep foresight exercise um, to try to understand what kind of challenges we're going to be facing on the technological frontier, but also at the nexus of technology and societal systems, human systems. So you could apply um, anticipatory intelligence to health security, global health security, um, to food security. Um, the idea is to really try to understand what is the nature and scope of the challenges, conflicts um, we are facing in the, in the future. Artificial intelligence is, a, is another beast, right? It's the it's other AI. Yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> it's not, a technological development, but uh, that, that will be pervasive and that will be evolving uh, with a need for foresight and for a need of anticipation. I figure some in, uh, confusion arises when people see the AI acronym uh, <laughs> applied to different things. We're, we're almost out of time, but Richard, before we are, we've been talking about the issue. For people watching who'd like to read it for themselves or even subscribe to future issues, can you talk to us about what you have coming up and also how people can subscribe? Sure. Um, 
speaking of AI in an, in terms of anticipatory intellig <laughs> intelligence, <laughs> yeah. um, the the quarterly as a publication um, strives to be anticipatory. Uh, it strives to be current and also prescient, um, picking up on trends in development that will continue to develop in major ways in the future. Uh, recently, we did a major issue on the Arctic, which is one of the fastest changing regions in the world. Then we did an issue on disinformation, which is very much au courant and, and also very much of, of the future. Um, and in this case, we also were, were prescient, and we will hope to continue to be. Um, our next issues, um, are in development. Um, the forthcoming issue in the summer will have to do with North American connections, looking especially at the ongoing NAFTA negotiations uh, and their broader implications. Um, we also have a special 50th Wilson Center 50th anniversary tie-in issue in store later in the year, uh, which will look at multilateralism, uh, which is very much a topic uh, of the news today and, and I think in flux in certain ways. Um, I'm happy to announce, as you know and as Eleanor knows, <laughs> and hopefully your viewers will, will learn that the quarterly is completely free. Um, you just go to the website, wilsonquarterly.com, and you type in your email address, and you'll get all of our latest content, and hopefully people will enjoy it. And with content like that and an offer like that, who could not do that? I feel like we're doing a telethon suddenly. But the, thank you. <laughs> Fascinating. I, I, I always enjoy the WQ and, and its history uh, from its inception as a print piece to all the brilliant things you've done with it today and the latest issue. And Eleanor, as always, I, I, you're, my discussions with you are mind expanding. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jen. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you.